We know only too well what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, the oceans would be missing something. Mother Teresa. Welcome to Warfare Advancement and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank everyone for continuing to listen and giving me feedback. Um, the last episode seems to have done pretty well, uh, at least uh, at least in the immediate release window. I uh, got a little bit more listeners in that first day than what I've seen before, so uh, I'm very pleased with that. Um, not too much direct feedback or questions that I've received about the last episode, so uh, nothing that I really think I need to go back over, at least at this point. I do want to go ahead and mention something. I am recording remotely. I did some traveling for Memorial Day weekend here in the States, so my setup may sound a little different. And I also have a dog nearby, and uh, you may hear that dog snoring or barking at various times. So I do apologize for that. <laughs> um, that being said, I'd like to go ahead and, well, just start with our episode's main focus, uh, or this week's episode's main focus. Uh, so we are going to be starting covering the Horn of Africa at 10,000 BC. And this is also going to include some areas to the south and west of that region. And the first and most important thing uh, that I should bring up is the main geographic feature of this region. There are no massive river systems like the Congo or the Niger River. Um, but it does have some small rivers and streams along with several large lakes. Now these have contributed along with the African tectonic plate splitting or beginning to split and this has caused the formation of the Great Rift Valley. Now this starts in the south of the continent at Lake Malawi's southern end and runs to its northern end and then from there there are two divisions uh, curving to the west around Lake Tanganyika and then curving back northeast all the way to the tip of Lake Albert is what is referred to as the Western Rift Valley or Albertine Rift is another term for it. But in most places I've read it as just the Western Rift Valley. Now the other Eastern Division cuts north uh, from uh, the northern part of Lake Malawi and basically it just runs straight north virtually. Uh, and it goes between Lake Victoria to the west and Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya to the east. Now this continues until you get to Lake Turkana where it bends to the northeast and runs all the way to the Gulf of Tajura which is in modern day uh, Djibouti which is that very small country um, it's just kind of isolated by um, or surrounded by its uh, larger neighbors, Ethiopia, um, Eturia, and Somalia. Now, this means that while there are large sources of water, they're generally surrounded by rough and mountainous terrains, so it makes the area difficult tra tra to traverse. It's not impossible, but it is very difficult. And due to the nature of the areas surrounding the rift, it shouldn't be a surprise uh, that this area is vital to a lot of different groups. And you, you know, if you might remember some of the things I mentioned in our earlier episodes, um, Lake Turkana and Tanganyika are very important. Like they found a lot of like very early fossils, not just for Homo sapiens, but for earlier hominids as well. So this area is very important, um, probably one of the areas that might be like an origin point for us um, but you know that's all theory we, we really aren't sure but again the area is extremely important to human history and uh, has been very well traveled to say the least <clears throat> now at 10,000 BC um, the groups of people living around this area would include some Khoi peoples um, and those are probably all around Lake Malawi and at the southern end of the Albertine branch of the rift. Now I've already covered them at 
you know, earlier episodes at, at this time frame at 10,000 BC. So I'm not going to go back into detail on them again, but I do want to stress that there are probably also some groups of these people in and around the Eastern Rift as well, uh, but they're eventually going to be expelled or subsumed or killed. Um, now, in uh, but you know that's again for future episodes to cover and get into more detail on. Uh, the next group of people I want to focus on are uh, in the kind of the northern part of the Eastern Rift, right where it starts to bend at Lake Turkana. Now, these people do not live through the bend, but they live along the river going north from uh, uh, Lake Turkana. So they live kind of more in a more mountainous region, uh, and they don't stay in that valley area. Um, the people that live here are, um, they speak a group of languages known as Omotic, that's O-M-O-T-I-C. These, now this, uh, this language family is a part of what is known as Afro-Asiatic, um, and this is a, um, as you can probably tell from the um, name, is a very large, at least in terms of geographic area, um, very um, widespread family of languages. It uh, it covers basically almost all of northern Africa as well as um, the Arabian Peninsula, and it's a very old language. Um, there is, of course, a wide debate about how old exactly. I think um, Proto Afro Asiatic um, is thought to have been spoken as like a single language between like I think it's twelve and eighteen thousand years ago, which is you know, which is basically right up until this time frame, depending on how you go. Um, the problem with this though is that the reconstruction is very hard, and there's a lot of um, information that we don't have, but I think. You know, the latest it could have, you know, split off from each other was 10,000 BC. I think it was probably earlier than that because, of course, the Red Sea had flooded back in and closed that land bridge. It, would, it still would be a possible trip to make with, like, very, you know, easily to make boats, but it's not something um, that you're going to be doing regularly, and I think that's probably a cause of uh, the drift. Um, but that being said... Uh, in this area, there's basically going to be two branches of Afro-Asiatic spoken. Uh, one of them is Omotic, and the other is Cushitic. And eventually, um, I believe it's going to be um, Semitic that's going to come back in the area, or maybe um, you know, when Arabs and um, Jewish traders uh, come back through. And of course, Egypt as well. Egypt is a Semitic language, or ancient Egyptian, I should say, is a Semitic language. So, a lot of give and take and back and forth in this area. Uh, but I want to focus right now on the Omotic branch of this family. Uh, and of course, it has divided itself between North and Southern Omotic. Uh, but generally speaking, um, all the people that speak these languages are stationed along this river. Now, you have, um, in the uh, South Omotic, you have uh, the, uh, I believe, Aroid, which includes some peoples known as the Ari, Gime, and the Karo. And then you also have um, a separate branch uh, that are non-Aroid. Uh, these include uh, people who are known as the Mao, the Bambasi, uh, Hozo, Seizi, Ganza, and then you have uh, uh, some Gizi, uh, and then you get into another branch known as uh, Ganga Emojin, uh, and these include people such as the uh, Anfilo and the Kappa. So you have a large divergence uh, in this family over a very small area, which leads me to believe, based on kind of what we talked about in the last episode, that this is a very old area that this language is spoken in because it has a lot of uh, 
divergence. So you know, we talk about how the more divergence you see in a spoken language over a general area means it's been spoken there for longer, um, just kind of a rough guesstimate. So the Amotic peoples have been living there for quite a while. Now, uh, as it comes to their religious beliefs, or their at least traditional re religious beliefs, I haven't unfortunately been able to find much in the way of specifics. Um, they, this region has been heavily permeated by uh, both Orthodox Christianity or at least the homegrown Ethiopian Orthodox Church, uh, Islam, and Jewish traders moving through, through the area. Um, they've been heavily um, converted uh, in, in both directions, both Islam and uh, Christianity have a very large part of the, the people there uh, practicing those faiths. Um, I think for Mao groups, Mao speakers, um, I have heard a little about a little bit about the Hozo and the Sezi. Um, and unfortunately, like I cannot find anything about their traditional re religious beliefs. I think after World War II, there were some efforts to kind of study these people a little bit more. Um, or to study Ethiopian history more, but unfortunately, because of uh, you know several coups and instability in the region, uh, a lot of funding dried up. And in fact, like most of the Yamadic peoples weren't really focused on because they didn't have like more religious connection with the Western world. So, unfortunately, because of all those um, interior uh, internal problems, you just don't get a lot of study in that area, at least as of now. Um, another group of Amotic speakers are the Hamar people, and they are an offshoot of the Arioid um, branch of the Amotic uh, languages. Um, now, they I do have a little bit more information about some of their traditional customs. Um, at least uh, they have a form of initiation for a young boy to become a man um, where he jumps a bull. Um, now, we don't know, I think, all the original religious connotations of this uh, because, again, they have been heavily proselytized to by others. Um, but it is basically a form of animism. Um, essentially, uh, a young boy, uh, he's basically, his female relatives kind of dance and um, invite um, men from the community who have already been initiated to kind of like, you know, whip him to kind of, you know, get him ready to go, and, um, you know, it, it's kind of like a form of ritual scarring, basically. It's nothing too, like, um, it doesn't maim them, but it does mark them, uh, and then they have to kind of um, run back and forth across the back of a row, a row of bulls or steers, um, and if he can't do it a couple of times, you know, he, you know, he, he fails and he's kind of ridiculed. Um, now also um, clay is used in styling hair um, and it's you know they use uh, pigments to kind of color it red and white and um, that's something obviously that probably goes very far back uh, they also have a kind of a um, religious uh, cleansing known as mingi uh, and this is done by also the Karo people as well who are another omotic group. But essentially, um, there are children uh, that maybe have like a physical abnormality or uh, a defect, and they are considered kind of ritually impure. Um, and so basically, like this could include things like, um, you know, mismatched teeth, like, you know, they have like the wrong uh, teeth where they should come out from, um, children born out of wedlock could be considered impure, and they can sometimes bring curses on pe upon people. And curses are a very, you know, um, something that's kind of uh, very uh, powerful uh, in this area of the world, and in West Africa too. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, voodoo that comes to Haiti, Haiti in that area comes from those people there. So curses are a very powerful um, motivator. Uh, when it comes to these people's kind of religious views. But essentially what will happen is that these, uh, that these children are uh, ritually ostracized from the group. Um, 
they would be kind of separated or driven away if they were old enough, um, you know, to kind of understand this. Um, it's basically like a permanent separation, and they would be left alone in the jungle or drowning in the river. Um, now, this is not done as often. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts by um, both Europeans colonizing the area and by the modern day governments there to like um, um, kind of clamp down on this. And there are people, even in these ethnic groups, that have been trying to rescue uh, children that have been deemed uh, Mingi. Um, so, but, I mean, this is obviously a very old tradition. It's part of um, you know, it, it's, it goes back, you know, all of basically recorded history uh, that this kind of thing has happened in the area. And these, they are not the only people that have done this. I mean, again, we will get into this later, but, you know, um, in Greece, ancient Greece specifically, uh, the Spartans would uh, ritually, uh, ritually, like, expel unfit children. Um, I think Mingi, uh, it's not necessarily done to children that aren't deformed or illegitimate. But I think if anything is kind of, they basically become scapegoats. If anything is causing any problems for the group, they're probably the first people that are pointed to as the cause. And at that point, they'd be ritualistically expelled from the group. Um, now, unfortunately, that's a little bit of a downer for a traditional practice, but uh, that's kind of what we have, or at least what I was able to find for um, uh, a couple of the Omotic peoples. And uh, I should say, in terms of group numbers, this is the smallest group uh, of Afro-Asiatic Afro speakers. And um, some of these groups are like under 50,000 people. Um, I think, you know, all total, you're only talking about a few million that speak an Omotic language at best. And it's kind of hard to tell, you know, Ethiopia has gone through a lot of issues because of uh, revolutions and external pressures from their neighbors in that region. And it's kind of made like um, senses or sensei hard to conduct on their, their kind of population. Still, um, there are beginning to be more people studying these various groups. Um, trying to, you know, do kind of an anthropological study and documentation. Um, of course, the numbers of these people, at least living their traditional lifestyles, is dropping. So um, hopefully we can get a better accounting of them um, before, I guess, things um, get too, mu too much more muddled. They're already muddled. Um, now another thing I want to point out about these people is that they are not alone in this region. Um, this is their homeland. They have lived here for quite a while, but they do have a lot of interactions not only with each other, but other groups passing through and kind of like claiming overlordship of these peoples, uh, you know, demanding tribute, payment, things like that. Um, the main group of those people are um, uh, Cushitic speakers, uh, which is another branch of Afro Asiatic. Um, and then, but then, of course, they also have uh, Semitic speakers that do that at various times as well. Although, again, this is all future uh, coverage, and um, we'll get into these uh, these events more later. Um, but yes, uh, you have other groups living in and around the area that are moving. Uh, you also have um, uh, Saharan uh, speakers. Um, which is another group we'll get into in the next couple of episodes uh, when we focus more to the north of this region, though there are some uh, in this region today. I don't know if they would have been in this region at 10,000 BC. Um, but again, I'm going a lot more in the future than I would like to at this point. Uh, I'm kind of covering stuff that is more important today than it was at that time, or, you know, didn't even exist at that time, which is something I'm trying not to do. I'm trying to, you know, take things as they actually happen or as we can best guess they happen. Still, um, that being said, uh, the next section of this um, area is going to focus on, uh, again, Cushitic speakers. 
um, and they have a very large presence in the Horn of Africa region even into this day uh, and they are much more well documented um, uh, historically speaking because there are m many more of them and they cover a much larger area um, where their languages are spoken at least. <clears throat> However, it is odd that they don't um, that at least they um, I believe they cover this area too, at least around the north and um, uh, east of the Omotic speakers. Uh, basically, think of the Omotic speakers. Uh, they are surrounded to their north, uh, east, and southeast by uh, Cushitic language speakers, uh, and some overlap in their own areas, but um, Oromo, not o Omo or Omotic, Oromo is their biggest, closest neighbor. Uh, and there are around 37 million people that speak uh, an Oromo language. And then uh, Beja is another uh, group. And then um, I think uh, to the south of them uh, are Barana speakers. Um, but uh, that's going to be our main focus kind of in our next episode. Um, I know this one's a little short comparatively to the last two specifically. Uh, but it is Memorial Day weekend, and um, I am going to be recording another episode, uh, kind of a supplementary to this one. Um, but I felt like this was a good stopping point because we have the geography of the region, um, you know, description of it now. Um, and then we also have um, one of the main branches of people living here at this time. Uh, and unfortunately, just due to the nature of history they are not that well studied uh, and that's unfortunate because I think there's a lot of interesting things that these people have done their practice um, and I'll see if I can find maybe one or two other groups there were there's a lot there's a lot of these people there are around 40 different omotic languages which are all spoken very you know, by various tribes um, again, there are not a lot of speakers in those 40 groups, but that's kind of is what it is. I do want to, before I sign off, I do want to make a clarification about the Homar people. Um, I know I mentioned that they had a bull jumping initiation. I doubt this is taking place at 10,000 BC uh, because they don't have domesticated bovines at this point. Um, but I do imagine that they probably had to hunt a bovine or something similar. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and get that out of the way because I know that was unclear when I was talking about it. So, But that being said, I would love to thank everyone for listening. Um, I'll have a link to Twitter uh, in the episode description. And um, if you uh, could please like, favorite, review, all that good stuff. Uh, and if you have any other questions or feedback, just reach out to me either um, at war at revpod at gmail.com or via direct message on the account on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for listening and I hope you have a good day. Goodbye.